Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome to the EDC Coffee Chat. We are honored to have the Executive Director of the Olympic Peninsula Visitors Bureau, Marsha Massey, on with us today to talk about her organization's work in the tourism industry and also what its relative impact is to our economy in Clallam County. Um, as most of you know, the Olympic Peninsula Visitors Bureau is much larger than Clallam County because uh, working together, people, we can get a whole lot more um, done uh, relative to marketing and advertising. And so she has done an exceptional job at that and has a really interesting resume and um, list of list of important positions behind her that she brings with her to the Olympic Peninsula. So um, we really appreciate her being part of our community and doing the work that she does on behalf of um, Clallam County. So a uh, few housekeeping details, if you'll put yourself on mute so we don't hear any inadvertent background noise and please. And also, if you have any questions, you can either raise your hand or put your question in the chat and we will call on you. So with that, Marsha, take it away. Thank you. Thanks so much, Colleen. It's great to be here with all of you on this delightful, finally summer morning here. Um, I will just give a preface to say some of you who have been at optic meetings or recent squim meeting, and I've had the privilege of talking about some of these things. So I'll apologize in advance if some of this is a little uh, repetitious for you, but uh, I'm delighted to be able to share it. You know, I said to uh, Lori, the problem is there's too much to share. So Colleen, can I share my screen? Yeah. Yes. Looks like I can. I will do that. All right. Is that visible to you okay? Yes, sure is. Great. So um, as Colleen mentioned, I my uh, my main job comes from the Olympic Peninsula Visitor Bureau, uh, which is located there in Port Angeles, and we uh, receive our funding primarily from uh, unincorporated Clallam County. But one of the great things about working regionally is that although we do have to, you know, follow the money as it were and be responsible to those that are, fund us, we by our nature, we work very collaboratively with the municipalities in Clallam County, so Forks, Squim, Port Angeles. And then additionally, through the Olympic Peninsula Tourism Commission, we bring in Jefferson County, Port Townsend, uh, even Mason County and the Quinault area of Grays Harbor County. Um, why do we do that? Well, because if you're in Austin, Texas or Berlin or upstate New York or St. Petersburg, Florida, you probably don't know the difference between Port Angeles and Port Townsend, really. You, you know you wanna to go to the Pacific Northwest. You've heard of the Olympic National Park. Maybe you've heard you can go up to Canada. You know, you have a general sense of it. So a lot of our work really is about promoting the region because we've got to get people to come to our corner of the world as opposed to Yellowstone or the Oregon coast or you know any one of a number of other great destinations. So I'll talk a little bit more about how destination marketing works, but just to set that up, when I talk about the Olympic Peninsula Visitor Bureau, I, I wear two hats and really it's all one big happy family. So um, I'm gonna run through some things today. I have lots more if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them or wait till the end and I can answer them, whichever is best for you. I'll touch on some of the American traveler sentiments, what, what's on people's minds right now as they navigate uh, return to travel. What are some of the economic impacts of tourism to our area? I'm just gonna touch on how lodging tax works because we hear a lot about lodging tax and it sounds simple and maybe everybody understands it, but my experience is that everybody doesn't always understand the details. And I think it's important to know how that works in the background. We'll touch on destination marketing and then what we can expect for this wonderful summer. So well, how are travelers feeling right now? Well, frankly, it's mixed. 
Um, people are very happy in their minds to have COVID behind them. There are a certain portion of people that are still being cautious about COVID protocols, but when the airlines dropped the masking requirement, that was a big sigh of relief to the American traveler. Um, America feels a little mixed about their financial well-being right now. Costs continue to rise, and those that report they feel better at this point than they did the same time last year financially has dropped, not surprisingly. Last year, about 33.6% felt pretty good. Now it's 31%. However, optimism is really still high. Uh, nearly a third of American travelers report that now is still a good time to uh, expend money on travel. And nearly two thirds of American travelers say that leisure travel has a high spending priority for them. One thing that's been interesting at uh, the beginning of June when the Biden administration lifted the pre-departure COVID testing requirement to enter the United States, um, that was great news for international travelers. I can tell you that our international travelers have been eager to get back to America and the Pacific Northwest is high on their list of places to come. So dropping that pre-departure testing requirement is great news for the international markets. It also means that American travelers are starting to think, woohoo, I've been locked up in America for two years. Now I can go to Italy or Iceland or wherever it is I want to go. So uh, there's a shift of how people are starting to think about travel. And about 30% of Americans now are, in, are indicating that they have a greater interest to travel internationally than domestically. Not surprising, really. What are some of the impediments to travel right now? Well, again, not surprisingly, um, a number of Americans are feeling the crunch of high travel prices. So this slide I first put together in May, and in May, 38% of Americans said travel prices were an impediment to travel, that it had kept them from traveling in the last six months. By July, that number had risen to 50, almost 50% 50 of Americans. So it's had quite a jump in terms of how the finances are affecting their decisions to travel. And correspondingly, inflation and trip cancellation has risen. In May, about 23% of American travelers said that recent inflation had caused them to cancel an upcoming trip, and that has jumped to 36%. Gas prices are having an effect. They are keeping people closer to home and road tripping. That's good for us. We get a lot of folks that like to come out and road trip to the Olympic Peninsula. Um, and honestly, it, it, it had a bigger impact earlier in the spring, but then when people started trying to book airplane tickets and saw how much the air fl flights were, they said, well, all things being relative, gas prices aren't so bad. So why does all of this matter to us? Well, tourism is really a major economic driver to our area. Um, the State of Washington Tourism Office contracts with Tourism Economics to do a series of analysis for all of our counties. They don't break it out uh, beyond the county level. So we just got the figures for 2021. And for Clallam County as a whole, direct visitor spending was $228 million in 2021. Not surprisingly, that was up about 48% from 2020, because 2020 certainly was a tough year for us. Um, lodging is a big piece of that. Lodging is about 45% of the pie, but food and beverage is another 20%. Recreation is a good piece of the pie, retail and transportation. So lodging has about $100 million in visitor spending. Food and beverage, which includes um, everything from the coffee shop and the ice cream store to restaurants, as well as uh, grocery stores. Uh, 45.5 million, recreation 21 million, retail 38 million, and again that can be Costco or the little shop, you know, Mosses on the corner, and transportation 22.7 million. In our county, uh, businesses that benefit from direct visitor spending employ uh, 1,800 employees. It represents a little over 5% of our county's employment. The local labor income is 57 million, and the state and local taxes generated 
directly from visitor spending is almost 21 million. I'm going to come back to that in a minute because, you know, we, we see the initial evidence of the visitors being here. We, we have businesses that benefit highly from that direct visitor spending. But remember that everything they buy, they pay tax on, and that goes into the state and local tax pool. And that 20 million, if we had to offset that, uh, would be a lot out of our pockets. I'm going to show you that in just a second. Won't go through all the numbers, but similar numbers for Jefferson County, a little bit uh, lower on the actual amount, 142.8 million, but a similar um, similar breakdown for Jefferson County. So back to that state and local taxes, that 20 point, uh, let's see, 20.8 million. The portion of that that's local taxes goes for the same things our taxes go to. It supports. Um, emergency services, it supports courts, it supports schools, uh, all of that. What if we didn't have that? What if we had to make up that same amount in the budget? Well, what that means is that the visitor spending, the taxes generated by visitors to our area, has a tax offset to each Clallam County household of $627. So I think that's pretty significant when we think about it. Sometimes, you know, in the heat of summer, everybody's like, oh gosh, there's so many tourists here. Um, but really they're helping us in ways uh, beyond just, uh, just the spending that they're bringing here. They're helping our tax base as well. So let's talk just a second about lodging tax basics. Um, some of you may be very familiar with it. I know a number of you serve on lodging tax committees, uh, but not everybody does. And I think anytime we hear the word tax, we think, oh, I don't want to pay a tax. I don't want another tax. Well, the important thing to know about lodging taxes, first and foremost, it's paid by overnight visitors. It is not paid by local residents. The only thing that generates lodging tax is an overnight stay in a hotel, motel, inn, cabin, campground, RV park, or short-term vacation rental. Uh, lodging tax <clears throat> is charged on stays of 30 days or less. <clears throat> so someone that's on a long-term stay of two months is, is not paying lodging tax. The way lodging tax works is there's a 2% credit against the state sales tax that comes back to that municipality. And then in our county, there's a 2% special hotel motel tax. Most counties in Washington, it's 2%. There are a few that have a 3% uh, special hotel motel tax. In some of the oh. larger counties. Marsha, can you, you explain know, that a little further and give like an example? So if- I will. Um, Let me awesome. pop right over to the next slide. Okay. Um, I wanna just stress that the RCW is very specific about the uses of lodging tax and it does benefit locals as well as visitors indirectly. So to your point, Colleen, mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna use uh, the Red Lion and Port Angeles as an example, but this could just as easily be um, Lake Crescent Lodge and the funds going to the county. So here's a folio of a guest that checked out of the Red Lion. And if you look down there, you can see the room charge accommodation, $99 state tax, $8.71, and then they call it occupancy tax, uh, $1.98. So <clears throat> the occupancy tax is the 2% special tax. And then the state tax, 2% of that state tax, it all goes yes. to Olympia and then it comes back to that municipality. So a portion of the state sales tax on lodging accommodations comes back to the municipality. So isn't it, I, I know the state always gets, well, typically gets six and a half percent of sales tax, except that we are a rural community. So we receive 0 0.09 of that. So actually they get what, 5.6%, I believe. And of any sales tax right and so is that so anything um when you talk about two percent share state shared um for the lodging tax is that uh 
that that's just typical. But then on top for like, if you bought a hamburger or something that would happen, but then on top of that is the 2% occupancy tax that we always talk about heads and beds Correct. is the lodging tax piece. Okay. Correct. So if you go on the Department of Revenue website to pull the data that we do to get lodging tax, we have to pull it from two different places. So okay. it's tracked on two different lines, if you will. So it, the total amount that comes back to us is 4%. You know, if you just want to do high math, it's two plus two, it's 4% of the stay is uh -huh. the tax that comes back to us. But the distinguishing part is, as you said, if you stay in lodging, 2% of the state sales tax you pay comes back as lodging tax. If you buy a hamburger, the state gets to keep all of the sales tax. Does that make sense? Oh, okay. But I think if you buy a hamburger, the state keeps 5.6. Well, yeah, whatever then, the math is. Yeah, and then the remainder comes back to the county or city. Is right. what I and there's smarter people on this call than I am, like uh, uh, Matt or Sharice. <laughs> I think I'm right about that. Uh, um, and then they also have like all sorts of programs for affordable housing or mm -hmm. for um, you know juvenile justice, those kind of things where they've added on a point one or something. And so, Marsha, one thing I wanted to know about you, you talked about the $627 for each household that it offsets. Mm -hmm. Is that just the, that 2% of state shared? Is that, or is that the 4% of special tax that that represents? So, uh, so two different things. When I was talking about the, uh, state and local taxes generated by visitor spending. You want me to go back to that slide? Would that be easier? Oh, okay, sure, thanks. So that, that whole pool of money, that direct visitor spending, the 228 million, mm -hmm. that whole pool of money generates state and local taxes of 20.8 million, according to the Department of Revenue. Okay. Um, that has nothing to do specifically with lodging tax or anything else. That's just gotcha. total visitor spending. And the math works out such that that tax base creates a tax offset of $627 per household. Okay. Nothing to do with lodging tax per se. Okay, got it. This has to do specifically with the lodging tax and then what lodging tax can be used for. So kind of two different conversations. Mm -hmm. So the lodging tax that's generated, the pool of money that is generated by what we call lodging tax comes back to the municipality, in this case, Port Townsend, I'm sorry, Port Angeles, because the Red Lion is within the city limits of Port Angeles. So it comes back to the municipality as lodging tax. It can only be used for the purposes outlined in the RCW. It cannot go into general fund. So lodging tax is governed, if you will, by a lodging tax advisory committee. So each municipality has a lodging tax advisory committee and they work with the municipality, in this case, Port Angeles, and they say, well, our pool of money is this big. It's $900,000. How are we going to spend that within the parameters of what lodging tax can be used for? And lodging tax can be used for generating more lodging tax, so promotions and marketing of tourism or tourism-related facilities. It can be used for operations for nonprofits and tourism-related entities. And in some cases, it can be used for capital if it's capital for a facility or an asset owned by the municipality. So that's way more detail than you want, but it's very, it's very structured. So in this case, the pool of money comes back to City of Port Angeles, who has a lodging tax advisory committee that guides them, though the City Council gets the final sign off. And they will let out grants for 
tourism related entities that apply. It does not apply for private business. So that's kind of an important thing to know. Um, but in this case, you know, we used examples, the Juan de Fuca Festival, the North Olympic Discovery Marathon, the BMX Park, because that is in, uh, they have uh, activities that are uh, both tourism related and local related. The Olympic Discovery Trail, it's an asset owned by the municipality. So they apply for grants, they are awarded grants for their various activities. They expend the funds, which is meant to attract visitors and create overnight stays, which then again feeds into the lodging tax fund. So it's a closed loop in a good way. And uh, these are, this is just a visual, I can give you the numbers, but this is just a visual on how lodging tax has performed over the last few years. So 2019 was a high point year, it was a record year all across the peninsula, all across the state for visitor uh, visitors. 2020, we all know what happened there. Uh, COVID knocked the socks off of us, but we have rebounded very strongly and 2021 is a record year all across the board for unincorporated Clallam County and our key municipalities. And I would just say if I were showing you the same chart for King County or Spokane County, it would not show the dramatic recovery that we've had. And this is just, I, I hope, a useful visual. So to your point, what are some of the projects or programs that lodging tax help support? Well, the obvious would be um, the North Olympic Discovery Marathon or the Juan de Fuca Festival or Crab Fest, those sorts of things, because you know those attract visitors. Mm -hmm. But the Olympic Discovery Trail, I mean, there between the county and the city of Port Angeles, there's probably over a million dollars of lodging tax funds that have been um, put forth to the Olympic Discovery Trail. And just stop and think for a moment, if that hadn't happened, how would we as citizens have had to support that? I mean, where would that money have come from? Similarly, the pump track that just opened, there's been significant lodging tax funds uh, put there and it will draw visitors, but it's also a fantastic asset for the residents of the county. So I think that's the piece that we need to do a better job of connecting is that visitors come here, they love this place, they spend money and they support our economy, but indirectly, or well, directly really, but through a process, they also flow back into things that really benefit all of us as well. Mm -hmm. So quickly, Marsha, question on that. Um, though the money can only go to a nonprofit organization, um, the nonprofit that actually ex expends the funds, they can advertise for profit companies. Is that right? I mean, if they do, if they receive some funding or you receive some funding for a marketing campaign, you can include Blackball that's a for profit or yeah. Olympic Game Farm that's a for profit, right. correct? Right. If it's, yeah. So, Maybe an example is um, the Lavender Festival that's going on right now. So there, there are ways that we have helped support, that Lodging Tax has helped support uh, the Lavender Festival and the Lavender Experience and stuff. And there are certainly, you know, the Lavender Farms are certainly for-profit entities that they are all part of that activity. Mm -hmm. And just to clarify, it, it's, um, there are circumstances where a for-profit business can receive lodging tax funds for a tourism related event that they are putting on. It gets a little squishy there. Okay. Uh, they can't just apply for a grant, say for uh, repairs to their facility or something like that. It's, it's not for that purpose. I'm happy to, if anybody has any more detailed questions, uh, I've got my contact information at the end and happy to help provide that. Um, just real quickly, because I want to be sensitive to our time to um, how destination mark. So that's what we are. That's the generic term for what we do. We are a destination marketing organization. And as Colleen said earlier on, we don't do this alone. 
um, at the state level, and I want to really shout out for them because, you know, Washington State for almost eight years did not have a state tourism office. We were the only state out of 50 that did not have a state tourism office, and I think that hurt us a lot. We do now. The state of Washington tourism is up and running, um, has a great group of folks leading it now. It is a public-private entity. It's no longer part of the Department of Commerce, though it does have a link with the uh, Department of Commerce. Um, I serve on the governor's uh, Washington Tourism Marketing Authority, uh, which is the oversight for that. Uh, they have new branding, a new website. I encourage you to go out and look at their new website. They've just finished their first big advertising campaign, hashtag true to nature. It's, it's really a great site. It lines up very well, or we line up very well with their messaging. So I think that's a, that's a good thing when you're both kind of on the same message. And they have the capacity to reach out a lot further than the individual communities do like, uh, like us. We also work with Visit Seattle and the Port of Seattle. Seattle, obviously the gateway, especially internationally to the Northwest. And both Visit Seattle and the Port of Seattle um, support overseas representation offices in key markets like Germany, France, the UK, Australia. So we work through them. We certainly couldn't afford to have a rep in the UK, but the UK is a major, major market for our area. So we work through them, whether it's co-op advertising or more often it's what we call familiarization tours where we bring in um, journalists or writers or travel professionals to actually see the area, experience it, and then go home and, and promote it. And then, of course, the Olympic Peninsula Tourism Commission, as I said. Um, collectively, we operate our regional destination website, which is olympicpeninsula.org. Um, you can use it, too. It's a great resource for locals as well. We produce, the, um, produce and distribute the Olympic Peninsula Travel Planner. We, do 110,000 of those. We direct mail about 16, 17,000 of those directly to people that ask us for information on travel to the Olympic Peninsula. We do PR and media outreach, bring in journalists, marketing, and so forth. And then we answer the phone call when people call and say, I'm coming. And how do I, what do I do with my one day on the Olympic Peninsula? Yep. So our work is really to try to get people to come in the off season come and stay longer and extend their stay. So a lot of it is showing people how all these communities connect together and why they need three days and not one day here on the Olympic Peninsula. Got it. I, I think um, the off season is such a critical piece. Um, so a couple questions in the chat, Mar Marcia. I don't know sure. if Lowell or Patricia want, Pat want to ask the questions yourself. If you do, please feel free. Otherwise I'll read your question for you. Uh, am I first? Yes, please, Lil. Okay, uh, I've signed. I have signed off of a lot of receipts on the money that uh, Swim spends on tourism marketing. And when I talked to uh, Sue about it, I was amazed at how much money <clears throat> was being brought in by tourism. So I'm, I'm, my question is: Do you have any kind of estimate to what you think uh, the return on investment for uh, tourism marketing dollars are? Thank you. That is a really great question, and I am going to show you when I talk about our marketing campaign. We do have some specifics. It's it's difficult, uh, not to be cagey, it is really difficult to know exactly what the return on investment of every single dollar that we spend is. But I would tell you, and I'll show you here in this marketing campaign, that it's anywhere from 10 to 20 times. So for every dollar you spend, you're probably getting at least $10 in return. So, and that means that money would be spent in the community, maybe on a hamburger or something, but also on a hotel. Right. Okay. All right. And Pat McCauley has a question. Well, I was going to wait till Marsha was done um, because this, she might answer this question. But I live on three crabs and I see four cruise ships a day go by my house. And I am wondering if you have some idea how much does that bring to us? Um, what kind of return? Because I know you market to cruise ships. 
So um, are we getting any pre and post travel that you can actually document? That's a great question, Pat. I can, I, can I actually document it? Not easily. Can I tell you what I think it is just based on some of the data that the uh, Port of uh, Port of Seattle provides? Um, you know, they are looking this year at having 1.26 million revenue passengers. That's what they're, they're, they're anticipating uh, one and a quarter million revenue passengers. They have data that says, um, oh gosh, I think it's like 70% of people extend their stay. 70% of cruise people extend their stay. Now, that could be they just extend their stay for two nights in Seattle. So we say our, our best estimate talking to the Port of Seattle is probably 10% of those people get out into the communities, you know, whether they go to Bellingham or Mount Rainier or over to the Olympic Peninsula, conservatively 10% of 1.26 million. Um, so it's really a rough estimate. I can tell you it's much higher with the international travelers because they they know that they you know come they're coming this far a, a much higher percentage of the international travelers do extend their stay and stay on and the olympic peninsula is probably the top destination for them so i would really have to kind of run the math to see if i could come up with a good number for you my my educated guess is that we might see you know three to five percent of the cruise passengers that, that is my educated guess, but I don't have hard data to be able to tell me that. But you're right, we do Thank market you, to the cruise. It, it kind of breaks my heart to see all those people go through Seattle and take all their money to Alaska. It's kind of a love-hate thing. <laughs> so I do appreciate knowing that you think if we get three to five percent, that's something. So thank you. I will continue to work on that with the port to see if we can get some better numbers. We'd love that. Anything else, Colleen? Uh, let's see, there was another question in the chat. I don't know if you're gonna get to it, but it's um, it was from Rebecca. We can talk about that at the end if you'd prefer, but um, her question, her comment was no doubt you've heard about the downside of short term rentals. It's taking hundreds of homes off the market from local residents who need housing. Do you see a way through this complication? I'm happy to have a longer conversation on it. Uh, I think it it is certainly a love hate relationship uh, with every community across the state. Uh, it's it's a challenge, um, and I think I think by municipal or not by municipality, but I think certainly county by county, they are looking at ways to deal with this. It's a complicated issue, as we've all seen. I don't have an immediate answer for it, but um, you know, I certainly think the short-term vacation rentals, we can argue all the pluses and we know the, the downsides as well. Um, but I would say that I, I firmly believe our county commissioners and our city councils are very aware of the situation and are hoping to be able to address that. And the only other thing I would say there is, again, people look at us as a region, people come here, they don't know when they're in Jefferson County or Clallam County. So I would encourage our elected officials to, to take a holistic look at it and try to work yeah. out whatever it is they're going to work out, uh, you know, that it, yeah. it's even across the board. That's a but really at good the same point. Time, at yeah. the same time, without those short-term vacation rentals, we wouldn't have had this level of, of uh, engagement because people wouldn't have a place to stay. Uh-huh. Two, two thoughts on that. So I totally agree with your comment about a holistic approach. We don't want pa a patchwork quilt of different regulations regarding this. It just kind of pushes the problem a couple, you know, a couple miles to the left or right kind of thing. But um, the other question I had about that is, as the short-term rentals increased in our county or the region, did was there a 
um, an associated decrease for the amount of stays in hotels? And what would that do, you know, for the hotel industry and the hotel operators if there was some kind of um, restriction on the number, if we if we move to having some of these short-term rentals turn into long-term or into uh, available housing for first-time home buyers, as an example. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, sure, in the in the dead of winter or in the off season, if someone says, well, I'm taking my family out for a long weekend and I can either stay in a short term, you know, I can get a, I can rent a house or I could stay in a hotel. Um, you know, if they're going to make the choice to stay in the house, then did the hotel lose that stay? Yes, there is some impact there, but then. You also don't know if a, if a family is left with a choice of I can rent a house and bring my whole family or I have to rent four hotel rooms, maybe I don't make the trip. Sure. In the summer, it, it's really had no impact because our hotels are running full anyway and we wouldn't have the capacity without some of those vacation rentals. So um, has it had any impact on the lot, you know, the traditional lodging? Probably a little bit, but not, it hasn't pulled the rug out from under them by any means. Okay. They've, they've done very well. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good to know. Yeah. And you would what? know because you guys get the reports and the lodging tax based on what, I mean, right. so you, there's beautiful data. <laughs> I suppose right. other people don't refer to data as beautiful, but <laughs> I, I frequently deal with really cruddy data that's not great and it's a lot of estimates, but your data is, you know, exactly right. So that's nice. Thank you. Well, we're grateful to have all of that. So let me run through our 2020, 2020, 2022 marketing campaign. And then I will touch it just a little bit on a couple of the things that, that you all have brought up. Um, I want to just talk about this and there's way more data than than uh, you all probably want so i'm going to hit the high points but to colleen's point earlier i want to assure you that our all of our marketing efforts are aimed at uh shoulder season so you know everybody wants to come in the summer and that's great and of course they use our tools our website and our brochures and stuff but we don't expend money marketing the summer because that's we don't need to do that. Our efforts are really in talking about um, spring and fall and winter to the degree we can. So when uh, when COVID hit and all of the travel just dried up, I mean, you all know the story. You know, it, it just tanked. I mean, the hotels, the businesses that relate that uh, were um, benefited from tourism, everybody's businesses really, really dried up. Restaurants are a great example. I mean, we benefit from all those restaurants, but we as a community could not keep our restaurants going without, you know, the benefit of the uh, visitors. So our whole marketing campaign has been aimed at shoulder season. We really honed in on drive markets because that's where people were coming from. So we narrowed our focus to drive markets. And we worked with our great friends at Blackball Marketing to come up with a campaign that the tagline was, you can't get any more Northwest. And it was a, an intentional pun on our geography, but also our lifestyle and that sort of really true, what it meant to be a true Northwesterner. So all of our messaging uh, was things like, when, it's, when you're happy it's raining in the forest, you can't get any more Northwest, that type of thing. Um, we just concluded our spring campaign. So we've run this, fall of 2020, spring and fall of 2021, and now spring of 2022. In our spring of 2022 campaign, we limited our media to television in the Seattle and Portland markets and um, digital ads on Google and Microsoft because that's where we get a lot of traction. So in the spring alone, the spring that just concluded, we had over 32 million campaign impressions um, this gets to the ROI that um, Robert asked about. So for the spring campaign, not the campaign as a whole, but just for the spring campaign, we spent $142,000. We worked with co-op partners. So we created a co-op opportunity for the city of Port Angeles, the city of Squim, city of Forks, 
and then Jefferson County and Port Ludlow joined in. They brought some money to the table. We ran uh, television ads and digital ads. <clears throat> we saw a 34% increase in our website users during that time period. And we could see spikes when the TV ads ran. We use an industry average on the low side of 2.2 uh, to 4.4% conversion with an average party spend of $432. All of that works out to saying that the campaign generated an estimated $1.4 to $2.7 million in revenue. And that's where I got the uh, 9.7 times to 19.4 times return on investment. Um, I will credit our good friend Ryan Mullane with the math on all of this. So um, it's and it's been very consistent throughout our whole campaign that we've seen um, about a 10 to 20 percent, depending on whether you take the low end or the high end of that. But um, I will tell you, I feel that that's still a pretty conservative estimate on that. And plus, you see over the times that the campaign has been running, you see continual growth. So it's what I call that compounding effect that these ads, as they continue to run, each campaign has outperformed the other. If you haven't seen the ads, that's by design. We're not talking to folks here on the Olympic Peninsula. We're talking to all the folks in the blue area. Uh, remember that the Canadian border only just opened up. So our ads have not, these ads have not been running in Canada. This is really Washington, Oregon. And just a couple of examples of some of the digital ads that, that you would have seen if you were in that blue area. So some of the, this was for the spring. Um, when you ditch the stroller for a backpack, you can't get any more Northwest. Or when your backyard is a million acres of wilderness, you can't get any more Northwest. And then the bottom row were the co-op ads that we created and they tied in with the television ads. So for example, the one for Forks said, when the creatures in the forest are real and mythical, you can't get any more Northwest. Or for Port Angeles, when an epic hike leaves you thirsty for more, you can't get any more Northwest. Uh, similar execution, a couple of the print ads you might have seen in some publications. We work with a lot of the photography has come from our friend John Gusman, so we try to keep it local. Now, I'm going to try and play one of our television ads. It's only 30 seconds. They don't always work well on Zoom. So we're going to give it a try. And Colleen will let me know whether we should show the other one. But we can put the links in the chat. And uh, if you want to, you can go out and watch them. They were all uh, 15 second and 30 second ads. And we thought they were a lot of fun. And again, they ran on Cairo. Como in Seattle and KATU in Portland. So Colleen, I'll give it a try. Right. And I did put the link in the chat if we okay. if it doesn't work. Let's see if this plays. Here in Hampton, Ricky Beaver Sports. When playing in the pool means checking the tides. And when your backyard is a million acres of wilderness, you can't get any more northwest. It's a way of life. Not just a place. And you can't get any more northwest than the Olympic Peninsula. When you're ready to experience wide open spaces and tranquil places, we are here to welcome you back. Your adventure begins at OlympicPeninsula.org. Did that work? Or not too well? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I we'll think skip. we get the flavor of it. You get the flavor of it. All right, let me fast forward through these other ones. Um, I encourage you to click on the link that Colleen gave and, and you can work your way through some of the ads They're They're meant to be tongue in cheek. Uh, we've got a lot of good feedback on them. And uh, I guess it's always a good thing when you start hearing from other people saying, hey, I saw your ad and do you want to advertise with us too? <laughs> so how are we doing this year? So just a couple of uh, charts here and then we'll move on. Um, we're starting to see a leveling off, which, which we predicted. So the orange line there is 2019. This is lodging tax. Uh, the blue line is 2020. You can see where things fell. 
but we started running our campaigns in the fall of 2020. So notice how the blue line and the orange line start coming together there towards the end of the year. And then the green line is 2021. So before the pandemic, 2019 was a record year for lodging tax all across the peninsula, hands down. Uh, and then in 2021, we just exceeded that. And in this case, when I say we, this is the whole North Olympic Peninsula. Uh, for 2022, we have continued to grow lodging tax revenues, but it is closer to the, uh, the green line. And so right now, as of June, at first quarter, we're about 12%. We've seen a 12% increase in lodging tax revenue 2022 over 2021. And we expect that it is going to flatten out and continue to follow that green line a little bit more. What I'm hearing from the hotels is that uh, although occupancy is softening a little bit, uh, they're making up for it in rate. So, mm -hmm. and this is just an overall picture across the whole campaign of how our website traffic has flowed. So during the time we've been running the campaigns, we've seen 172% increase in our website traffic versus before we were running the campaigns. And that's all by way of visitor engagement. It's not just clicking people that go to your website, but it's how many people are learning about us. What's the engagement level? And then similarly for lodging tax uh, across the whole campaign. So what can we expect for the summer? Well, we're in the midst of summer, of course, but let's just talk about a couple of these key things. Travelers have returned to the skies. Um, SeaTac Airport is reporting uh, in the, the week of June 12 to 18, TSA screened a daily average of 54,800 departing passengers, and that is the highest number that they've had since the end of 2019. There's a beautiful, magnificent new international arrivals facility at SeaTac International, so we are ready for these international travelers to come back. Uh, there are a number of new airlines that are starting service uh, from foreign countries to SeaTac, so it's great news as the international travel starts to return. Um, I recently returned from an international trade show, and I can tell you that we're going to have UK, uh, Germany, the Netherlands, the Western Europe is who we'll see first. The Asian markets don't expect to be back until 2023. To Pat's point about cruises, uh, Port of Seattle has a strong cruise season, Alaska cruise season this year. Started earlier, it's going a little later, running uh, mid-April to mid-October. Uh, they are expecting 295 scheduled ship calls and 1.26 million revenue passengers. So we already talked about that a little bit. And on the positive side, the small cruise ships have returned to the Olympic Peninsula. So you probably see American cruise lines and uncruise out there and so they too are promoting and bringing visitors to our area of course we have all celebrated the reopening of the u.s canada border and it's just great to have the black ball sailing again they have reported that their traffic is still below 2019 but their package bookings are strong and the forward indicators are very good and then the latest news of course we're delighted and eager for dash air shuttle to start in August. I think that's going to be a great thing, not only for residents, but also for our visitors. Mm -hmm. Hotel-wise, it's super busy on the peninsula. And if any of you have relatives coming and you don't want them staying with you, you better book their rooms <laughs> right away because the hotels are uh, really full. I am hearing a little bit of softening, but um, the, the rooms seem to fill in behind. So there's a little bit of a delay over when people used to book, but the rates are pretty high. Most people coming out here uh, are not anticipating rates in the $300 or up for the Olympic Peninsula, but that's certainly what they're seeing. Marcia, just, can you go back to that last slide? Where is that place, bottom left corner? That beautiful place is Domain Madeline. Oh, wow. I, I've been there, but not in that room. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't think I paid for that. That is That's Domain beautiful. Madeline. And that room you will probably pay closer to $700 a night for right now. Mm -hmm. um, 
yeah, we have some beautiful upscale B and Bs, and we have some upscale travelers that come here that are paying four and five hundred dollars, six hundred dollars a night for a room. Mm -hmm. So one of the issues we are dealing with here uh, is what we call crowd disbursement. I know you're all very aware of all of the the crowded points, points of compression here on the Olympic Peninsula, but in that regard, we also operate as a destination management group because really it's not just about bring more people here and more people here we really want to be responsible in our messaging about how to disperse people and how to point people towards not going to all the crowded spots so hurricane ridge a lot of our messaging is around go early in the morning go in the late afternoon embrace the sunset take in the night program. And of course, we're thrilled, thrilled, thrilled for Kevin's new Clallam Transit shuttles. I think that's just a real boon for all of us. The Ho Rainforest is the busiest destination in the National Park in terms of lineups at the entrance fee. So really, I would encourage all of us to just wait until fall. Again, we're, we're encouraging people to either go early, go late, or giving them alternatives of places they can go. And then, of course, the Ruby Beach closure this summer is a thing, but all we, we've pretty much pulled most of our pictures of Ruby Beach. You know, we're just trying to encourage people, letting people know we have alternate beaches, beautiful places to go, and try to be responsible. So if you go to our website, you'll see we have um, blogs about other places to go that are less crowded. That's a lot of our messaging there. And why did Ruby Beach close? They are, uh, the park is working on a project to repave and regrade the parking lot and the access. Okay. And so they needed, there may be more going on than that, but it's basically a repaving and of the parking area. Gotcha. So my final point to you all is this, it all begins with a visit. I didn't make this up. I credit the woman that I heard it from, but when you build a place that people want to visit, you build a place that people want to live. And when you build a place that people want to live, you build a place that people want to work. And when you build a place that people want to work, you build a place that business has to be. And when you build a place that business has to be, you've come full circle and you built a place that people want to visit. So that's I think nice. that's a nice uh, ending to all of this and how it ties into economic development. Great, thank you. So I see Jim has a question. Jim, go ahead. Unmuted here, here we go, thanks. Uh, Marsha, you're probably aware of this, but I just want to bring it out on this call before I ask my question. Um, you're aware that uh, Washington DOT is gonna be doing some uh, fish passage uh, work in the downtown area a couple of places and then uh, further to the east in Jefferson County also that's gonna and that begins next year unless it slips so 2023 to 2024 is going to be the window when traffic is significantly constipated in in and around Port Angeles which is going to affect everybody so you know awareness is really the key issue right now uh, question relates to wages uh, salaries and so forth in the tour and tourism industry mm -hmm. uh, typically speaking that's a fairly uh, low level lower level of wages than other economic sectors you know no value judgment there whatsoever but that's just a fact. <clears throat> Exceptions like for the black ball ferry workers and so on, that, those are pretty high paid jobs. But <clears throat> do you, which is probably the more accurate view? Are we successful at, at broadening our tourist season, season out on both shoulders leading to a higher level of employment for longer during the year? Or <clears throat> is it, um, you know, macroeconomic factors like trying to trying to attract workers and having to pay more to get people to work for your business. And which is it, or is it a combination of both? Do you have a, a sense of that? And that is a super good question, Jim. And I think we could probably spend a long time on that. Um, first, I want to acknowledge what you mentioned about 23 and 24. Thank you for that. And just be aware that um, 
we have already started that discussion in the Olympic Peninsula Tourism Commission group, right. and we will bring others into that because we're we're aware of a number of things that are happening in 2023, the road closures being the big one. Hurricane Ridge is going to be closing the visitor center and doing work. So we've kind of already got a board on 2023 and yeah. starting to think about how do we message that and so forth. So would welcome uh, your input on that. Um, on the subject of wages, I think, you know, it is a it is a common perception that all hospitality jobs are low low wage jobs, and that's not true. There are a lot of uh, entry level jobs, but I know for a fact that the Red Lion right now is offering uh, housekeeping jobs at twenty five dollars an hour. Now that's you know that's pretty substantial. There, they're still having trouble filling those jobs. So I think it's a little bit of both is the answer to your question. Um, I know in the time that I've been here. I have seen that shoulder season push out significantly. I'm, when I started six years ago, I mean, we really were Memorial Day to Labor Day with a few, you know, Crab Fest over here and something here. But the, the, the communities have worked together really hard to get that message out that spring and fall are fabulous here. And I know talking to some of the um, B and B owners and so forth. I mean, for example, we used to hold, we used to hold our um, tourism um, summit in October because everybody was pretty much done. And they said, great, you know, we have time to do it. Now everybody's like, we don't have time to do it in October. We're busy in October. So we will get back to the tourism summit. But but folks are busier well into, you know, March, April on out into October. So I feel like as a community, we, we, we got work to do, but we've done a good job. And the correlation there is that some of those seasonal jobs do stay on. That said, you know, they're still there. I mean, I think labor is the big challenge this summer for all the hospitality people, whether it's hotels or restaurants, everyone, every call I'm on, everybody is um, concerned about finding the, a labor pool. Mm -hmm. And some of that does relate to housing as well. So it's a little bit of both, I guess, is the answer. Yeah. And the other point um, James made here, the entrepreneurs in tourism make really good money. It's, um, you know, their employees are not necessarily full time, usually not benefits, you know, that kind of thing. But it works really well for a certain segment of the population that maybe doesn't want a full time job and maybe have kids at home or that kind of thing. Um, so it is a solution for a lot of people, but yeah, we, it is interesting to see, have those, what has the current shortage in workforce caused? And it sounds like certainly for, um, the red lion, they are, it is pushing that wage upwards. Well, which, it is for restaurants and all too, you yeah. know, um, mm -hmm. It, it's certainly right that people make living wages, absolutely. And I think, you know, just even simply put, we can all see even around us uh, as residents as our favorite restaurants have to pay more for the food that comes in and pay more for the employees and pay for benefits. Those, their margins are small. Sooner or later, we're gonna be seeing that on the menu. Yeah, and we are, I think, <laughs> I sure have been. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so Marsha, it is nine o'clock and I think that's probably a great point for us to close off this morning. We sure appreciate all of your work and your time today presenting all of it to us and educating us. Um, and we will have this up on our website, uh, Choose Clallam First under the uh, Coffee with Colleen link if anybody wants to share it with someone else or um, wants to look at it later. So thank you everyone for joining us and thank you Marsha so much for joining My us. My pleasure. Today. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. All right.